right, well, welcome to First United Methodist Church. Uh, it's good to be with you today and to join, uh, have you here for worship. Uh, I want to say welcome to everybody who's joining us online. We are so grateful uh, for the chance to worship together today as the church. Uh, it's great to, to be here and certainly to have the privilege to come before the Lord together as his people, those claimed in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for being here. If you're online, we invite you to follow a link uh, to a QR code. You can sign in if you're a guest and visiting with us for the first time. Uh, we'd love to know that you gather with us. And um, if you're a longtime member or been associated with our church for a while, welcome one another in the comments section as well. Uh, but we gather here today for communion. Uh, we celebrate communion the first Sunday of each month. And so we gather here at the table of Jesus Christ to not only be reminded of the forgiveness of sins offered in his name, but certainly the gift of new life. Uh, and so as we get ready to come to the table, let us begin uh, by preparing our hearts through worship. So we invite you to stand and let us sing together. Our opening hymn, Majesty. of ages cleft for me. If you join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, Holy Spirit, come. Come into this worship service and take our breath away. Give us the sense to know when you are with us. The stillness to hear you coming and the heart to invite you in. Allow us the chance to feel you moving among us as we speak your name, as we sing your songs, and we worship you here this morning. Through you, Holy Spirit, we know peace, though we are surrounded by chaos. With you, Holy Spirit, we know the familiar comfort and strength that we are surrounded by an ever-changing world. Around you, Holy Spirit, we are surrounded. But we come to know the needs of your people and find ways to serve them. For you, Holy Spirit, we slow down time so that we can celebrate every moment with our families, our faith, our faith communities, our Bible study groups, our small groups, our discipleship bands. For you, we are intentional about making room for your presence. Oh, great spirit of God, instill in us a sense of community responsibility. Encourage us to love one another from a safe distance during this time of COVID. Remind us all of the importance of wearing masks, not just for our health, but for the health of others. It is when we gather that we can feel your presence best. Bless us as we continue to care for each other, protect each other, pray for each other, and respect each other in that way. Now let us say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture today comes from Luke chapter 7. We'll be looking at verses 38 through 36, excuse me, through 50. As we approach the word of God, we are mindful of, of in the season of Lent, how we're walking together as a, as a church community and family through the gospel of Luke, not only preaching on the stories on Sundays, but we're encouraging you uh, to be studying the, through the book on your own. But we are intentionally walking with Jesus through his life and through this season so that we, when, when we get ready to celebrate on Easter morning, are already having journeyed through the life of Christ, ready for all that we receive through his gracious invitation. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this one who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You know, as we've been reading through Luke's gospel, I often find myself going through the stories of Jesus and I begin uh, to think to myself, oh man, I wish I had been there to see that. Have you caught yourself thinking the same, going, oh, what it would have been like to hear Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount? What it would be like to see him calm the storm? to call the disciples and bring in the great catch, how great it would have been to see and to be there to witness it. I'm not sure this is one of those stories for me. I'm not sure that I really find myself wanting to or needing to be there at this scene. And the reason is that every time I read it, I can't get over how uncomfortable it must have been to be one of the guests at the dinner, to see this scene unfold as it does. 
You see, Luke does a great job of kind of helping us understand the scene of, of what's happening here. We, we find that Jesus is eating at the house of a Pharisee. He did that too, by the way. And, and, he, and he's sitting there, and they're likely eating somewhere in the courtyard because Pharisees were influential and often wealthy, and wealthy people had courtyards so they could invite guests. And Jesus happened to be the guest of honor. And, and, and at such a moment, it was customary that when rabbis would visit the house of someone like this, that the doors would be open for people to kind of come in and out of the courtyard to listen to the rabbis as they would teach. But while it was customary to invite many to come, it was far from customary for someone like her to show up. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a small town, which meant that you knew at least something about everybody's story in town. And because of that, that meant that your reputation preceded you, right? I hear Midlothian used to be one of those towns, right? <laughs> well, this seems to be the case for her. You see, when she shows up, she's immediately identified as a sinner. Even Jesus knows this about her. Even later on in the story, Jesus will identify her as one whose sins are many. And so it seems rather odd that she would show up at a, at a party like this for a Pharisee because Pharisees and people like this didn't seem to interact very often. Neither one of them had much need for the other. Someone of her reputation had nothing to offer someone like Simon. And all Simon could give someone like her was rebuke. But she didn't show up for Simon. She came for Jesus. You see, his judgment, she'd felt a thousand times over, but his grace, she had never seen. And so she summons the courage to enter the home of a Pharisee that she might express her love for Christ. We're told that as Jesus is reclining at the table, that she comes up behind him. It's worth noting just for some accuracy here that, that their tables and seating situation looks a lot different than our day. Their tables were low to the ground and you didn't sit in a chair, but kind of a low lying couch so that when you reclined at the table, you would sit to your side with your left arm on the table uh, with your right arm free to eat and fellowship, with your feet kind of splayed out behind you, with your sandals already removed. And so when the woman comes to Jesus, the only part of Jesus she has access to is his feet. Understood by the Jews and her culture as the most shameful of parts, something that no one would touch, not for any reason. It was reserved only for the lowest of slaves and servants. And yet this woman um, falls at the feet of Jesus and begins to weep. Overcome with love and gratitude, she begins to weep at his feet, washing his feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair. As if to say to Jesus, like, I know how much I need you and I love you. And I will be your servant. It's at this point that Simon and probably everybody there in the courtyard is watching this unfold. And, and I'm sure there's conversation happening amongst the table, 
but it's the kind of conversation where you're just saying things you're not thinking of because all you can see is something weird happening that you can't not watch. And Simon himself, who's sitting next, next to Jesus, begins to wonder, you know, does, is Jesus really the prophet who we think he might be? You know, if he was, he would know the kind of person who's, who's touching him, that even though he can't see her, would know the kind of woman who is touching his feet. And he uses this to kind of question Jesus. Now, you'll notice that this isn't something that Simon says out loud. He knows better than that, right? It's just something he thinks in his mind, and yet Jesus answers him. And he does so by telling a, a parable. It's simple, both in its form and its message. There are two debtors, one who owes much, and one who owes little. And both are forgiven. Jesus ends with a simple question for Simon and all those who are listening. Who will love more? I like many of Jesus' parables. The answer is pretty clear. And Simon answers him correctly, but I, I have to wonder if he really got the message. You see, one of the messages behind Jesus' parable is that the person who loves more is the one who understands just how much they have been forgiven. You see, the reality is it doesn't matter how much is owed. It's their understanding of just how much they have been forgiven. That's the key for Jesus in this parable. It's recognizing how much we have been forgiven. And Jesus uses this to tie and link our understanding of our love for God to how much we have been forgiven forgiven. We look at this and we begin to assume that Simon himself sees himself as someone who has been forgiven less than the woman who's washing Jesus' feet. You know, some of the irony here in this story for us is that while most of us in this story would choose to be the respectable Pharisee rather than the sinful woman. It's her who's in the enviable spiritual condition of knowing how desperate her need is for Christ. She knows that without him, she has no hope of forgiveness and life. And so she clings to him, she gives of herself to him, and she expresses that with everything that she is. And it's Simon who is deceived. It's Simon who, who seems to forget, who's blinded by his decency, hiding behind his religion in believing that somehow his need for God's grace is any less than hers. And the fact that Jesus shares this to a person who is religiously faithful should not be lost on us. Especially those of us who've been around the church for a long time. Because one of the things that I think Jesus is saying to a Simon and to us is that we can so easily be deceived. and begin to lose sight of just how much we need God's grace. We can begin to lose touch with just how much we have been forgiven. 
As I read through this story over and over again this week, I, I think the question that just came uh, over me for, for you and, and for me as well is just I have to wonder how aware we are of our need for God's grace today. Do you know how much you have been forgiven? Do you, do you see yourself as someone who's in need of a lot of forgiveness or, or just a little? That you see yourself maybe as someone who's, well, pretty good compared to most and, and I really just need Jesus to take a little bit off the top. Or do we see ourselves as someone who is desperate for the grace and the mercy of God? You see, the need to ask ourselves these questions is really underscored by a very subtle and easily missed point in Jesus' parable. And the underlying point of this parable um, isn't the dramatic difference in the debt that's owed, which often steals our attention in this parable. Now, the great contrast in the debts that are owed, but, but actually the point is made in what the two debtors share in common, that neither of them could pay the debt that was owed. The one who owed little could pay no more than the one who owed a lot. And the point that Jesus makes to Simon and to the woman and the point that he makes to us is that we all owe a debt we can't pay back. And, and it really doesn't matter whether you see yourself as needing more forgiveness or less forgiveness. The point of this game that we often play with our neighbor of measuring our sins against the other, comparing, perhaps somehow determining who has a greater need, Jesus says, look, on a certain level, that is completely irrelevant. Because whether you owe a little or a lot, you owe something you can't pay back. And Paul points to this same thing in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, when he says, Look, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. That if you want to play the measuring game, guess what? No one measures up. We all fall drastically short of the standard by which we are measured. And if you want to give your time and energy to saying, well, I don't need as much as my neighbor, then you've just deceived yourselves and you've lost sight of something you need to acknowledge. You know, just before this, Paul emphasizes a point that's made over in the Old Testament that, look, there is none who is righteous. And every one of us, whether we're in this room or watching online, find ourselves owing a debt because of our sin that we are hopeless to pay outside of the mercy and grace given to us in Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus highlights this profound point during the meal as he seeks to teach Simon. And I don't know if you picked up on it in the scriptures, but there's this movement that you might argue is, is subtle, but its message is profound and, and recognized by Simon himself. You see, as he begins to teach Simon and probably hopes to open his eyes to his, his need, he turns away from Simon to address the woman. And looking at her and watching her in her act of devotion and love, he begins to teach Simon while not even acknowledging him. 
And he does this for all the guests who can't take their eyes off of this scene, this uncomfortable scene. And Jesus looks at her to say, this is who you need to be. This is the kind of spiritual condition of someone who is ready and open and a recipient of a grace they do not deserve. It's someone who sees their need and comes and falls at my feet asking for mercy and grace. This is who you need to be in the story. Not the one deceived by their decency but by the one who is so desperate, they're willing to throw decency out the window because their need is too great to play the games we can play in the walls of religion. Jesus looks into the eyes of this woman perhaps the first time. They look eye to eye. And he said, your sins are forgiven. You see, this is the beauty of the good news of Jesus Christ. For those who are willing to see their need and fall at his feet. Now, while Romans 3.23 might acknowledge our brokenness, Romans 3.24 speaks to God's desire to save in Jesus Christ when he says, For all are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. All are broken, but all can be redeemed. This is the gospel message. All we need is to see our need and our desperate spiritual state and fall to the feet of Jesus. And this is the invitation for every one of us, whether we've been in religion for years or whether or not we're encountering the church for the first time today. All are invited to come to the table of Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness and new life. To walk away from an old life and an old reputation to embrace a new life in Jesus Christ, a life of peace and joy. But a life more importantly founded in and with him. You know, the woman found this grace at a table. And today we come to another table. The table of Jesus Christ. The table in which you and I receive an invitation. Not because we deserve, not because we've earned the right to come to this table, but because Jesus in his grace and desire to redeem has invited you to come. And we come to this table not fooling ourselves into thinking we're better than we are. Not deceiving ourselves and thinking, well, my need for God's forgiveness is less than my neighbor's because they do this and this. No, we, we, we cast that aside. We adopt the, the position of the woman who sees her need and desperation for God's grace. And we fall at the feet of Jesus as we remember all that he has done to redeem us. And we remember that on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is going to be broken for you.
And during the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a cup of forgiveness. My blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. We come to the table today to celebrate the saving work of Jesus Christ. To celebrate the act of his giving of his life and the shedding of his blood that you and I might be redeemed. Not only forgiven of sins, but freed to a new life in Christ. A life which is the fullness, the the real life. We're invited to come to this table. So we invite you, whether you're at home or here, to take the cup. And you're invited to receive the body of Christ. May you take the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Let us bow in prayer together. Almighty and gracious God, we come to a table of which we do not deserve. And yet you have given us a place. You have given us an invitation to come and receive of a meal and a blessing that we cannot earn. We come as debtors who are unable to pay, unable to settle the debt that we have incurred. And yet Jesus is a gracious host. You have taken upon yourself our debt that we might have a place with you. God, I pray that each and every one of us might be aware of our great need for grace. We may not lose sight of it. May we see ourselves as those who are forgiven a lot so that we can love you a lot. So that our hearts would be filled with gratitude, that that gratitude would drive a deeper and a greater love for you. So that we could begin to serve you as you deserve to give of ourselves freely and fully as the example this woman has set for us. And we pray that you would accomplish this all for your glory. For you deserve it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are not only forgiven, but we pray. Amen. If you'd all rise, please, and join me in singing, I Surrender All.
Uh, well, I want to thank you for joining us here today in worship, uh, especially if you're visiting with us today. Again, we have a, a QR code for our visitors and guests if you want to sign in and give us your information. Also, if you're online, there's a, a link to follow as well. Um, you know, what a joy it is to come together as the church and be reminded of the, the beauty and the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, this Lent, we're, we're reading through the Gospel of Luke, and I want to encourage you, if you've been reading, to continue to do so. If you haven't, um, it's not too late. You can pick up, and in fact, you can follow our, our waypoints, which are found online under on our website under Media and the Waypoint Devotional. They'll help guide you through a daily reading and meditation as we walk through the life of Jesus. Um, uh, you know, we gather here um, as the church recognizing that we are called together as the body of Christ. We're called together for many reasons because God chooses to manifest himself in the life of community in unique ways. And so we come together recognizing the gifts that we put together have the power to, to move mountains. Uh, and so we encourage you as you think about um, as we begin to leave this time that you can make your gift, your financial gift to the church. And, and that can be uh, at every exit point. There's a place to give uh, as well as online. There's a link to follow. Uh, we are, certainly appreciate your gratitude as it is empowering some great ministry in a difficult time in our world. So thank you for all that you've done in that regard. Uh, but we leave this place um, being mindful of our need for God's grace. And Jesus doesn't remind us of this to keep us in a place of shame. No, it's quite the opposite. We're reminded of our need because we're reminded of what Christ has done. It keeps us centered in, in who Jesus is and who we are. And it empowers us to love in deeper and greater ways. And so may we leave this place fully aware of our need and fully aware of the desire of God to give and surpass our needs. May we leave as forgiven people, freed for joyful obedience in the name of Christ. Amen. A closing hymn when we all get to heaven.